Thanks. All right, a couple things before we kick it off. Um, three things, really. Number one, if you haven't already, please make sure you donate to the Capital City Black Nurses Association. They have been incredible partners of ours, and they would really appreciate a donation, as we would as well. Number two, this is your opportunity to listen, learn, and connect from other nurses in so many different ways, so take advantage of it. And we are recording this session, too, so we will share it out after the fact. And three, this particular session is all about career advancement in different ways beyond the bedside. So this is your chance to really get inspired and really pave your path in your way. So agenda, real quick, we're gonna talk entrepreneurship with Monica Elston, freelance writing with Portia Wolford, innovation with Tofiki Gafar Shainer, and then we'll close it out. And we will have questions after each speaker. So if you have them, just kind of keep them together and you can put them into the chat box and Casey will log them and make sure we get them to the speaker in, in question. So with that, I'm super excited to introduce Monica Elston Carter. Monica, take it away. Hello, hello, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, I'm getting a thumbs up from Nicole, from Casey, from Doug, beautiful. Hi, I'm so happy to be with you guys here today. I was telling Nicole I was sweating a little bit because I have daughters and we have big ZD and ZD was everywhere. So my husband is dealing with that right now and I get to be here with you guys. So I'm very excited. My name is Monica Elston Carter. I am a family nurse practitioner, but I work in obstetrics and gynecology and people ask me about that all the time. Women's health has been my life's work. It's been um, something that I knew I always wanted to do but I like the FMP route, and some people might understand, it's a little bit more marketable where I live in Washington, D.C. So yes, I'm an FMP working with women, pregnant women, gynecologic women, all the above. Um, I am a wife, as I told you guys, and I am a mommy. I have three beautiful daughters who are 21 months old, Bellamy, Caden, and Kennedy. They are triplets. <laughs> Um, I know for a fact I don't have the time to give you guys the whole story today because they gave me a time limit. And for any of you guys who are in my network or know me, it's rough with me with time limits. So I'm not going to get into the story, but let's just say it was the shock of a lifetime. And I actually diagnosed myself with triplets. So I actually did my own scan and I was the first person to see all three babies. I went to Hampton University and Georgetown University here in DC, Hoya Saxa, and I'm now working full time as an FMP. Um, fun fact, I guess it's fun fact because we're all nerdy health nurses and everything like that. Um, I got 26 blood transfusions during and after I delivered my girl. So I actually la I lost my entire blood volume. For those of you guys who know, the blood volume is about 5.5 liters or so in our body. That plus an additional 2.5 liters of the next set of blood that was in my body. So for all of you that are blood donors, thank you. All right, we can go to the next page. All right, so my journey. So we're talking, you know, nursing beyond the bedside. And like many of you, I started at the bedside. I was a registered nurse in labor and delivery um, here in DC for about six years. Went on to MP school where I became a family nurse practitioner. And um, now I'm an FMP. I'm always a nurse. I'm always going to be an RN, but I'm also an entrepreneur. So as you can see on the screen, outside of my full time MP role, I'm running a school of nurse practitioner students and current MPs ready to just really level up in the workplace by learning the art of negotiating. So what is it that I do? I have a course called the Compensation Course, and this is where the entrepreneurship comes from. The Compensation Course is a 21st century guide for nurse practitioners to really negotiate the job of their dreams. I go through everything from what you should be asking for in contracts to salary, to how to negotiate, how to interview well, contracts, um, the red flags, you know, those non-competes and all that crazy stuff. So I really talk to nurses, nurse practitioner students, and current MPs about to how to really be happy at your job and how to be somewhere where you really feel valued. Um, and as you see with my quote, really my hope is to empower every single woman, no offense to Fiki, but every single woman to live the life of their dreams, um, to really just feel valued and and, and have the life that they've always wanted. And I've learned that that requires negotiation. A lot of times as women, um, and especially as nurses, we just make it work. Like we just do what we gotta do as women, as moms, as nurses, and we make it work. And sometimes that kind of leaves us with 
really nothing with the bottom of the barrel with the scraps. And I want to empower all of you to not take the scraps, but to get the entire barrel. Who wants the bottom of it anyway? I guess unless it's a barrel of wine, but that's not the point. The point is I want you all to learn the art of negotiation so that you can get what you want out of life. So we're going to talk about what we're learning. And this is kind of like the, the vibe that we're all going to be giving you guys today as panelists. So my first learning is additional streams of income. I told this to Nicole and Casey and Topeka and Portia before that. I used to think that people who had sideline gigs or extra jobs were like poor. Like for some reason in my mind, and I don't even like that word, but I thought that, you know, that they like needed money or they were desperate or they were really, you know, not able to make ends meet. And then I've learned. Number one, everyone should have an additional stream of income. You know, I am working full-time as an MP, but I also have three other um, additional streams of income in addition to, you know, I'm married, so we have additional streams of income through my husband. Additional streams of income, so when we're talking to you about entrepreneurship, this will help you to reach your goals faster. If you need to pay off your loans, if you want to put money down for a mortgage on a house, um, if you want to go on a great vacation, if outside ever opens up for us to vacation again, you can reach your goals faster with additional streams of income. You'll also be able to fund your passion. So if your passion was similar to mine to create an incredible course, to create a school where you could have um, people learn from you, you might need some money to put into that. Maybe the website, maybe you need someone to design it. Um, my course is professionally filmed, so I had to pay the media company, stuff like that. So for those of you who want to be entrepreneurs, after you realize, okay, an additional stream of income is good and I want this, you need to find your niche. You need to figure out what's right for you because what's right for me might not be what's right for you. Um, example, we're pouring ourselves into our jobs every day. We give all of ourselves to our patients. It's mentally, emotionally, and it's physically taxing. Some people would not want to ever do a coaching and mentorship or a course or an ebook or something like that because they've already been feeding so much into other people all day. They don't want to continue to do that after hours. So maybe coaching's not for you, but maybe you love fashion. So maybe you want to start an e-commerce line, cute little yeah, nurse t-shirts or maybe pens. There's these these really cute um, nurse and nurse practitioner pens that people wear. Or create your own scrub lines. There's yeah, tons of scrub hello, lines coming out. We you know hello. the That's heavy hitters. Hey, let's not compete. Everyone mute yourself. All right, so we know the heavy hitters for scrubs, right? But you can actually create your own scrub line. Or maybe you wanna open your own practice. Maybe you're gonna become a nurse practitioner, or even as an RN, you could have your own IV hydration service, you can have your own medi spa as a nurse and get a collaborating physician. So there are so many different avenues for making additional streams of income where you can use your passion um, really to, Pad your pockets, right? Use your passion to pad your pockets. So you're going to figure out your niche. You're going to understand that you need the extra money. And then number three, it's time to launch. So I'm running through this quickly because I told you guys I have a time limit. So I'm letting you know what, when you're, it's time to launch your paid product. You want to first create an email list, build a community and build trust. So you want to kind of Endear people to your cause. If, if you're going to launch uh, an apparel line, so you're going to launch your scrub line, you want to get the email of all the nurses you know. You want to talk to the physicians and, and, the, and the PAs and the PPs and anyone you know who wears scrubs. You want to talk to them and get them on your email list so that you can have a direct contact with them that doesn't include social media. Because guess what? We don't own Instagram. We don't. We don't own Instagram. We don't own Facebook. And if one day, poof, it's gone or the algorithm changes again, does that mean that all of your contacts are gone? Well, I hope not. So build your community, build that trust, have an email list, have a website. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be free right off of Wix.com. Have something that is almost like, and to me, a website's just like a, um, what are those things that we used to give out to people? Your business card. Your, yeah, your website's like a business card these days, right? Like a digital business card. All right, so you're gonna build your list, you're gonna build your community, you're gonna tell people, hey, I'm doing this, please support me. And then you can have something that's free that can be a precursor to a paid product. So maybe you'll send you know, 20 or 50 friends your scrub so that they can show them off, they can market them for you, they can feel them, they can say, these are so soft, I love this, you know, you know, contact Sarah, she has these scrubs. Next thing you know, mentorship is important. Launching your paid product is going to take mentorship because there are people who have done this before. 
find someone who has started their own scrub company and pick their brain. You might even have to pay a few dollars to do it because time is money. So you might say, hey, can I do like a coaching call with you? Like, can I sit down with you? Who was your manufacturer? You know, what, what were the roadblocks? What, what should I know when trying to launch this product? So for entrepreneurship, I said yes to extra streams of income, find your niche, and then you're gonna need to launch. And I tell people sometimes, you just do it. You just do it. You never feel quite ready, but if you have an idea, if you have a passion, if you have something that you're super interested in, full speed ahead. All right, quickly, the advice, the three C's. Number one, collaboration over competition. Again, I cannot stress it enough. We're nurses. We're used to collaborating. We're used to leaning on each other. We're used to um, kind of getting, kind of, I don't want to say getting in bed with each other, but we're used to it. I mean, we are. So collaboration over competition. Find people that you admire, that you respect, that you trust, and talk to them. Collaborate with them. Do an IG live with them. Do a, a, a blog post with them. Get on the podcast of some of your favorite nurse entrepreneurs. Collaborate with people because your network is truly your net worth. And when you have that network expanding because now you're in their network, that's more people who can be endeared to your cause and eventually become a paying customer. Consistency. A lot of times the only difference between those who are successful and those who aren't is consistency. I know people who had the best idea. I have a friend who had a candle company. The candles smelled amazing. One day I went to buy more and the website was gone. And I was like, hey, what's up with the candle company? She's like, eh, I don't want to do it anymore. So, or, you know, I wouldn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't that successful. Consistency can create success. With consistency, you'll become successful. If you're doing the work and it's a quality, it'll become successful. Lastly, character. We're, again, we're in healthcare, we understand, you know, morality and ethics and just really that good stuff that makes you a good person. Be of great character. I always say if a person needs a refund, give them their refund. Give them the little raggedy refund. Give them their refund. Be of good character because it always comes back to you. You want to practice um, just how you do in nursing. You know, you always, you know, give every patient a bit of the doubt that you're giving great care to everyone. You're taking care of the whole person person head to toe, do the same thing for your customers. So whether it's mentorship or an apparel line or a new practice or, or whatever you're wanting to do, that character um, being consistent will help you to be successful. Oh no, that's it? Gosh. We've that's got it. a couple minutes for questions for Monica. So if y'all wanna go ahead and pop them in the Zoom group chat, it could be about anything that she went through. We're super happy to have her address them. One question I have would be, what was one of the biggest hurdles you faced when you were starting your compensation course? So I would say, because I don't have a background in marketing and business and communications, advertising, any of that, I think the hardest thing was just knowing like where to start. What am I supposed to do? Like, where does this course live? Am I supposed to record it? Is it supposed to be live? You know, I think the hardest thing was just figuring out the logistics. Um, and then it's funny, my husband was like, Monica, write the course. And I was like, oh yeah, we should do that. So the first thing I really needed to do was write the course. And it took me a long time. It, it's a dense course, it's um, very robust. The students that have been taking it in peace, I think that in the last six, in the last seven weeks, we've brought in over $275,000 on my nurse practitioners contracts. So this is nurse practitioners who have renegotiated their contracts from my course or new MPs. We have brought in over $275,000 for renegotiations and we brought in about $400,000 for new grad MPs for their first contracts. And I'm talking six-figure contracts for new MPs in all parts of the U.S. So um, we have receipts. So I think the hardest thing was really writing the course. I wanted it to I wanted to give them all of me and everything that I've learned over the past 12 years about negotiating, about salary, about compensation, about how to create productivity bonus structures, how to kind of really let people know you know what you're talking about with the RVUs and all that crazy stuff. So definitely where to start. And honestly, the first thing I need to do was just write the course. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you for that. We have a few questions, so we'll try to go through, the, through these pretty quickly. 
um, from Lene, is incorporating something we should do, be doing if we're interested in nurse entrepreneurship. Do you mean incorporating like, like an LLC or paid as or, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, she said yes. Okay, it just depends on what you're doing to be honest. You know, so, so for some things I do think you should get it trademarked. Um, there's a lot of copyright infringement. So for some things I would definitely do that. You know, as far as your tax, it's really about tax bracket, tax, I mean, tax status. So if you become, if you wanna do an LLC, but you're not quite ready, or maybe you don't have the money to become an LLC, cause it does cost money. Um, you can actually become like paid as, and that's like your own, you're the sole proprietor for this business and you're paid as, and it's going to still be going to you, but it's kind of saying that you're setting up kind of like a business. If you have the time, if you have the money, um, certainly, absolutely. Okay, perfect. And then obviously yeah. eventually as you start making money and you want to change, you want to polish up your whole look, a better website, better marketing materials, definitely you would want to um, go ahead and do that for sure. But I don't want that to deter you from starting your business, which is usually people's issue. Sorry, Casey. <laughs> You're totally fine. I love it. Um, you have so much great knowledge to share with us. We're going to do one more um, just because of the sake of time. But I think confidence is a big part of starting your own company. How did you know you were ready to start? I knew I was ready to start when I sat in over nine meetings to renegotiate my own contract to get a new productivity bonus structure for myself, to get a new salary. And I did, I mean, endless work, endless research, back and forth with my former boss, thank God. Um, and finally, a contract was presented to me that was, it was awful. It was awful. And there was a contract presented to another nurse practitioner from the bonus structure I created 2.5 seconds later, that was literally what I created. So when I realized that there was this inequity, and, and, and I'm saying this, and it might make some people feel uncomfortable, but there was, there was, a, there was only one thing different between the two of us. And, I, and I'll never forget how I felt because I did the work for this new bonus structure. I did the work for this new salary and it was given to her, which was insane to me. And I remember I called my dad and I said, this is what's happening. He said, are you ready to fight for this? Because you might lose your job. And I said, yes. And that for me was the moment that I became really who I am today. I became a person who's confident. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know what I made up. I know what I can do. I know I'm valuable. I bring a ton of money into my practice. And I'm like, you know what? I'm willing to fight for this. And thankfully, when it was brought up to this person's director, they were like, oh my gosh, this is an awful mis injustice. Like we're changing this now, Monica, we got you. And I got way more than even I asked for in the beginning. So me speaking up and deciding I do want to fight for this. I do want to do this. Um, I, think that, I think that was the moment when I said, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready not only to give myself the best, but I'm ready to make sure every single MP out there has the confidence and the skill to be able to make sure that they can level up and get the best contract and have the dream, like their, their dream job. So that was, that was my, and like I said, I'm going to go over with talking. So if you guys want to talk more, I'm on Instagram. I'm sure Casey and Nicole will tell you where to find me. I have a free master class on Thursday. Come join me. Um, but yeah, I I can be a pit bull. <laughs> Thank you for that, Monica. Thanks, Monica. You're welcome. Thanks. You're the best pit bull out there. Um, <laughs> so this is so happy that she was able to share that information. I'm also super excited to now share uh, the screen with Portia Wolford. Portia, all you. Hey everybody, so the first thing I want to do is stop my video because I don't like to see myself talk. So I'm gonna stop my video. <laughs> yep. All right, so my name is Portia Wofford. Uh, I am a nurse and a published writer. I'm the owner of a content firm called the PW Agency. I'm a Southern girl, girl. I was born and raised in Alabama. Roll Tide. Any Roll Tide fans out there? Roll Tide Roll. Um, and so y'all are going to hear a lot of y'all, but my y'all is definitely for real because I'm def definitely Southern, like deep, deep South. I spent 10 years as a nurse creating content and solutions for my employers that affected positively, positively affected the patient outcomes. And this is a fun fact. Um, I think I was like in the fourth or fifth grade. I, I was always talking. I was always, you know, doing outbursts in class. And my teachers taught me to use my words. 
I stuttered her a lot then. So my teacher, she was trying to, you know, give me some confidence. She's like, Portia, just slow down to use your words. So I turned that into an entire portrait exhibit in my middle school library. And it's still there to this day. My son actually came home from school one day and wanted to know when I came to the school and put all this stuff in the library. So good. Um, so my journey started, um, I've always been a writer, but my professional journey as a writer started when I was a home health nurse. I was a home health nurse for about four years. And for those of you who are listening, who know about home health, I did, I did home health, not home care. So I would go and see like seven patients a day, spend 45 minutes a piece with them and teach them about their medical diagnosis, signs and symptoms, their medication, you know, all that good stuff. And so what I, learned, what I learned was that my patients kept going back into the hospital. I did not understand why they kept going back into the hospital until I kind of did a QA on myself and found out they didn't understand what I was teaching them. So I rewrote all of the uh, patient material that the agency gave me and drastically dropped my patient's hospitalization rate. So I spent four years as a home health nurse and I learned how to, I always say I learned how to untangle healthcare and medical terminology uh, I recognize the health literacy challenges and use my words to create patient education that connect it. And these days, um, I run the PW agency and I also manage a team of nurse writers and we create content and sales messages for health uh, related brands and organizations. So we're gonna talk about the three learnings that I have for you today is content matters. So every great brand needs valuable and relevant content and consumers who are the readers want credible, high quality content. Um, and who better to do that than a nurse? Who better to write you know, this content for these health related brands than a nurse? And then we're gonna talk about the impact of recommendation. So after reading recommendations, 61% of online consumers in the United States then decided to make a purchase. You know, nurses, we've been voted as America's most trusted profession, I think for like the past 18 years in a row. So when you write something as a nurse on healthcare or when you or when you write about a product that people or write about a product, people take that at, at face value. Um, plus, as a nurse, you're going to back that up with evidence based research and you're also going to back that up with your experience. So when a health related brand needs someone to write that credible, relevant content that's easily digestible, that's easily read, there's no other person but a nurse, in my opinion, who should be writing it. And to start your freelance writing business, what you need to do as a nurse is you want to establish authority and recognition. And you're going to assess what you bring to the table. You, you bring your skills, you bring your originality, you bring your past experiences, you bring your specialized knowledge. Specialized knowledge, again, nurses are the perfect people to write content. We know how to break down medical terminology. We know how to explain medical procedures. We know how to speak in everyday language. Plus, we have a network of other healthcare professionals who we can reach out to as, as subject matter experts. And you as a nurse, you have a unique perspective from the healthcare side and from the patient side. So we are the ones who bridge the gap between the community and healthcare. And your network equals your net worth. I have built my entire business on my network. Um, one, people are more likely to hire someone that they know. So, you know, you're building your network. I'm not here, I'm writing. I know other nurses who are entrepreneurs. I know physicians who are entrepreneurs. I know, you know, PTs and STs and OTs who are entrepreneurs who I've written for. And so when someone in their network starts a business and say, hey, I need someone to write an article on diabetes, or I need someone to write an article on hypertension, they can refer me because they know the type of work that I do. Using your network to using your network to leverage, uh, you also going to use your network to leverage their audiences. So you're going to build your network to grow your freelance writing business. Um, you're going to use your network to be exposed to the audience of to the audience of the people. So they, they they're potentially your new clients. So this can be like a social media takeover. This can be guest blogging. This can be them sharing your work. This can be them referring you to clients. Anytime you get a chance to be in front of someone else's audience, you're going to leverage that to build your potential client base. And then networking also helps you suggest and accept joint venture opportunities. So these are things like speaking engagements, hosting opportunities, being a podcast, I mean, being a podcast guest. Again, you're putting yourself in front of these people's network and they potentially have your clients, your potential clients. 
and because and then your network can turn can turn one stream of income into multiple streams so because so many nurses ask me how to do what I do, I decided to use my network to build another brand called Nurses Who Write, where I teach other nurses how to do what I'm doing. And then I also, not only do I teach them those nurses, I take those nurses and I use those nurses to write assignments that I can't write. So I build a whole new stream of income from my network of nurses. And then the three C's to building your content marketing business, it's gonna be connect. You're gonna connect with whoever your ideal client, um, your ideal audience is. Then you're gonna convince them. Um, so you have to convince them that you're the person who can help them reach their goals. And then finally, you're gonna convert them over into a paying client. And that can be by showing samples of your work. That can be by showing your portfolio. That can be by showing your testimonials. That can be by sending them to people who you've already worked for in the past who can give you references. So you're gonna connect, convince, and convert. Thank you, Portia. Content's always been so, so critical in my life. And so I loved um, all of Portia's tips and tricks. So if you have questions, pop them in the chat and Portia can tackle them right now. I think one I had that I think would be helpful for other nurses, um, how did you get started writing? Did you just start writing and pitching yourself? Did you um, kind of search out potential companies who would need someone like you? Did you straight go through networking? Would love to hear kind of how you got going with that. Um, I, re I found companies that I wanted to write for. Like everyone says to start small, but I'm a millennial, so I don't start small. I just go for what I want. So I started reaching out to like the, the big nursing like platforms that I wanted to write for. And so somebody told me, yeah. And then I like killed that first article that I wrote for them. And they were like, hey, we really loved your article. It did really good. We want to bring you back to write for us again. I was like, uh, yeah, of course. And so once I was able to kind of like build a portfolio off the things that I wrote for them, then I started reaching out to other platforms and saying, hey, this is what I did for them and I can do the same for you. Wonderful. And I think I just, I just shared it in the chat, but she's actually written several pieces for us as well that are absolutely wonderful. We, yes. we should send them out to you guys Thank after you. the event. Yeah, they're so good. I think maybe one more piece that if someone's considering writing, um, you know, nurses are so skilled in so many different ways. Writing is not maybe the top of mind choice for, for nurses to expand, you know, their career beyond the bedside. Um, what type of skills, um, I know you teach nurses to, to write super well um, and really kind of articulate their point. What would you say are the top couple skills that you think nurses should tackle right away to, to be um, freelance writers? Um, you're definitely going to have to retrain your mind because when you're in nursing school, you know, when you're writing papers, you're, you're writing like really formal but you have to learn how to write you have to learn how to write conversational so you're having to learn how to write things that other people want to read so i always say i write how people speak um that's one thing you have to retrain your mind a lot of the nurses i work with they have a hard time doing that because it's so hard to not think to write like you're writing an english lit paper um and then number two you have to be super disciplined because your clients are not going to come to you you have to go out and find them so I literally about 50, I send out like 50 letters of introduction a week to people, to potential clients, because you have to keep those clients coming. If you don't keep them coming, they're definitely not going to reach out to you. Now, I have had some clients to find me um, just with the things I've written, but most of them I've reached out to. And then um, I'm very introverted, so you're going to have to come out of your, you can't be uncomfortable. Like, you're going to be uncomfortable, you have to get used to being uncomfortable. You have to get used to putting yourself out there, get used to being told no. Um, and then you're also gonna have to get used to realizing that, okay, I love to write, but I need to scale my business. So what can I do next? So you need to be very, very flexible and you have to be very innovative, but you're a nurse, you're innovative anyway, you're flexible anyway. Excellent. That's awesome. That's such good advice. Yeah. Um, we did have a couple questions. Did you take up a professional writing course? Um, I did not, when I started, no, um, I luckily I had a little look on my side cause I've always been writing since so like five or six. So it's kind of like a, just a, a talent that I was born with, but I have taken, um, other courses since I started writing to stay up on my skills. Like I taught myself how to be a copywriter. I, I spent tons of money on copywriting courses. Um, I had to read books. I bought all these books to learn how to write conversational style. Um, I reached out to other writers and asked them, you know, can you read this and can you, can you critique this? So I have invested, but when I first started, no, but as I went along and realized I wanted to scale, I started investing in courses. 
Awesome. Um, we have a question. How do we contact you via email or is there a better way to contact you? I am on Instagram at the right nurse. That's W W R I T E the right nurse. And I'll put my email in the chat for you guys. Perfect. Um, and then one last question. Do you receive compensation for the majority of your work? And how long did it take for you to start doing so? I received compensation for all of my work. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I did not write for free. I mean, when I first started, I did like a couple of free guest posts. But when I took it seriously, no. Like, so I've been receiving compensation for like since I started. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Portia. That was wonderful. I learned a lot myself. Thank you. Thanks, Portia. Thank you. All right. Tofiki, you there? Can we hear you? Hello. I can hear you. We're good. We're good. All right. So, hi, everyone. My name is Tofiki Gafar Shaner. I am one of the co founders of Frontier Health and Resources. Um, we are a company, just two nurses um, working on changing and inventing things that are going on. Um, at the bedside. Fun facts about me, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, but I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, I don't have an accent, so people are always surprised to hear that I'm an immigrant. Um, yeah, currently I'm working at the bedside and also working at IT. It's kind of odd to be an IT nurse, but also at the bedside. My hospital luckily created a um, kind of hybrid position for myself and my business partner to kind of help solve some problems that are going on during COVID. I'm happy to be there. And then um, another last one fact is I've been married to my high school sweetheart. We've been together for 13 years, I've known her since sophomore year high school. It's been a wonderful ride. Um, next slide, please. Do you see it, Tofiki? No, I don't. I should see the first slide. I see it on my side. Does anyone else not see it? I see all good. the ne next slide. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. I have it here. I have it here. I got it. Um, so my journey from um, being an RN to an innovator, it's been about taking every opportunity that's come towards me. Um, there we go. Uh, every opportunity that's come towards me to improve myself and to help those around me. Um, being an inventor and innovator, it's kind of just been, I've been a There we go. I'm on the next slide now. Um, it's been an opportunity for myself to help other nurses with questions that they have about um, inventing their own product or working on building a business for themselves. Um, as an innovator, a lot of us get really excited about new technology that's out there, smart watches, kind of cool things. But it's important, this is one of my really favorite quote of mine, it's excited to get really, it's easy to get really excited about new technology, but make sure it solves a problem, not creates one. And so you have to think about um, innovating from a problem solving perspective, not a, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this perspective. Next slide. There we go. So a couple of learnings. First thing is why should you innovate? Why is it important to innovate? Um, a couple of things, boomers, healthcare costs, and big tech. So when I say boomers, it's kind of like a, what does that mean? Uh, the details are about, if you think about the average age of the majority of nurses working today, they're between the age of 50 and 65. They're getting ready to retire. Their career is to work for a long time. So we're going to have a gap in the amount of nurses that are available for work. So what value can you create? What ideas can you come up to to, one, help them transition to retirement or maybe help them use the knowledge and value that they had over the last 30 to 40 years to help newer seasoned nurses? That's a way to take advantage of the, um, the situation that nursing is going to be in. Yes, there's a lot of people in nursing school. But are those nurses prepared to replace the ones that have all that knowledge? Another thing is boomers in general have a different expectation of care that they want to be provided to them. They want to stay in their homes longer. They don't want to go to nursing homes. This is what research is finding. So who's going to be the one to create that product to help boomers stay safe in their homes, to help them feel monitored, to watch out for falls and all these other things, um, to keep an eye on their medication taking, but also keep them looped into our healthcare system while they stay in their homes. Um, the next thing is healthcare costs. And I know as a bedside nurse, we always go, ah, I do my job, I'm not worried about the cost of providing important care. But with the increasing cost of healthcare, hospitals are going to have to cut people. And that's a sad fact. And so we have to think about, is there a way that you can innovate even in your current work or the current practice that you're at to save cost? Or even, are there ways of things you can invent to help your patients, because they also get a large bill at the end of the day, right? To help them stay home, 
and keep monitoring their health? Is there an app that they check in with that's like a nurse version of a Fitbit app that helps them stay healthy and stay out of the hospital and helping them save costs? And the next thing is big tech. It's kind of like Thanos. Thanos, if, you, if you're into the Avenger movies, um, Thanos is somebody that came and it's something that you can't really do much about. So if you think of companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, right, the big five, they are working on products and services that fit our patient population. So there's two things you can do. The first thing is you can prepare yourself by creating innovative products, um, studying innovation, working on design, and all this stuff so you can get a job at those big companies. Who doesn't want to work for Apple? Who doesn't want to work for Google and Amazon on those things? So you can be prepared for the transition. Or if you think about it, if they are taking um, – uh, a piece of our patient population. How is our hospital supposed to compete? How is your hospital supposed to compete? If Walmart can start a Walmart Health, it's something that they're doing now. It's a, it's a facility they have. They've turned some of their buildings into a health facility where you can see a primary care doctor. You can see um, all. You can get a vaccine. You can do all these checkups for less than a hundred dollars. How is your hospital supposed to compete? So maybe you work on innovating at again at your workplace and making sure you're competitive enough to compete with the big five. So that's kind of why you should innovate. Next slide, please. So the other, so now you've thought about innovating. Where do you start? You have to look at the workarounds that you're doing at your job. You're not the only one doing workarounds. It's kind of a secret of the trade is that, you know, as a, as a nurse, I've been doing it for a couple of years and I'm, maybe I have a student with me and I'm like, oh, let me teach you this thing that I do with IV poles or let me teach you this thing that I do with gloves to make sure. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that we all do. So when you, when you think about your workarounds, actually, they work for more than just you and the people on your unit. You try to problem solve for everybody. For example, myself and my business partner, we were fed up with seizure pads, See, um, lack of seizure pads, actually. We were fed up with the fact that we're using linen and blankets to keep patients safe. And so we solved the problem just to use in our own work. But that led to my third point is when you figure out that, you monetize your solutions. And so when you're monetizing your solutions, you're figuring out, okay, this actually can work for not just for myself, but for everybody else. And you find a way to package it and put a pretty bow on it and show it to your friends and show it to your coworkers and show it to the nurses in your area. Luckily for us, we've been able to find a universal solution for seizure pads that works not just in, in the, our area, Bay Area hospitals, but all over the state and the nation. So you have to think about those workarounds that you do and how can you monetize that to benefit your patients and yourself. Next slide, please. So, you want to be an innovator, you have your idea, then comes the fear, right? So you go, I don't know enough to be, I don't, I'm not that creative, I don't know enough to be an innovator. Um, you have to get over those fears. There's, I didn't know enough when I started my business. I didn't know enough about manufacturing, writing a patent, getting certain things made, but you learn these things along the way. Don't let that stop you from even exploring the idea. Um, some people say, I don't, I don't know how to write a patent, I don't know where to start. There's so many resources, which we'll talk about a little later. The next thing people say is, I don't have enough time, which is sometimes pretty valid, but if you think about your week or your day in the form of hours and minutes, how many minutes can you put towards your passion project? 30 minutes every other day towards your passion project, two hours on the weekend towards really solving this, uh, working on this idea. Uh, maybe, maybe it'd be freelance writing or maybe it'd be um, working on these other things that um, we, you as nurses can provide. You have time. I myself was never caught up on Game of Thrones. I never watched the whole, the whole series during the time that they were showing up every week. I was busy working and that's okay. I caught up at the end of the season. It's okay to miss something while you're big, building your legacy. Last thing is some, someone will steal my idea. This is a, you know, it's a relevant, it's a, it's a pretty relevant fear I think we all have. I have this idea and if I tell anybody, somebody's going to steal it. That's truth. And for myself exactly, when I first was thinking about how to solve um, seizure pad solution, I ended up approaching my business partner and saying, hey, I have this idea for something. Um, luckily, we built a little bit of trust um, prior to that, but he could have stole my idea and I'd never seen him again. But the thing is, by collaborating with him, by being open and sharing my idea with them, we were able to get to where we are today, to have multiple hospitals that we service and to have a product that works for everybody. But if I kept it to myself out of fear, I don't help myself and I don't help my patients. So it's always important to be open and share your ideas. And also, I didn't even make them sign an NDA, which I do regret. Um, in retrospect, you should always make somebody sign an NDA, whether they're your mom or your friend or whomever. Um, always make them sign an NDA. I'm glad things worked out for me, but as protection, you should protect your ideas. Next slide, please. 
Um, next thing is, uh, my advice for you, if you think about it, is, is like I talked about fear. Don't let it be debilitating, let it be a motivation. If you think about it, okay, I have an idea that I'm really worried somebody's gonna steal. I really got a patent immediately. Then get it done. It's that simple. Then research what you need to do to get it done. Um, don't, don't just hold off, you know, I don't have enough time, I'm really worried, how much is it going to cost? Those things will answer themselves along the way. You will partner with people to help you with, with certain things. And if you keep it to yourself, you don't move forward. Um, and the next thing like I talk about workarounds is focus on the problem. If you think about the things that you're doing at your bedside compared to um, what everybody else is doing, you might have a solution that you can share with your coworkers and you work your way from there and try to fit the technology into it. Um, is if, if you're just looking at what cool things can you do, you can't get very far with that. But once you solve a problem, you're not the only nurse with them. Nurses are jobs despite being all around the nation, all around the world actually. There are many parts that overlap and you can find something that works not just for you, but for everybody else. And the last thing is finding resources. It's 2020, there are many things you can do to help resources. Let's say you have an idea and you want to 3D print it. Um, you don't know how to 3D print. I don't know how to 3D print, but there are many websites and resources such as Upwork and Fiverr out there that help you um, that help you with 3D modeling or they help you with writing a patent. You want to make a logo, a fancy super duper logo, and you don't know how to do Photoshop. There are people out there that you can have as subcontractors and you'll pay them commission for that item that you're asking for. So you don't have to be the everybody, the everything, but there are certain things you're going to have to outsource to people out there that are trustworthy and, and that have built up websites that you can pay and then, and, and have that relationship with them. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Thank you, Tofiki. We do have a few. Casey, want to read them off? Absolutely. Uh, Tofiki, how do you deal with patent trolls claiming that your idea has already been patented? Um, patent trolls. That's all. If you're thinking about it, when you're trying to patent an idea, the first thing you're going to do is a patent search. Okay, so you, whoever you hire to do uh, to write your patent and work on a patent search, they should be doing an exhaustive search on what's already out there. So if you have an idea for a you know a way to keep IV tubing off the ground, is it already out there? That's the first thing you're going to do by looking through the patents that are. Maybe you do it yourself. Google has a uh, a way for you to search through our patent registry in the US or you hire somebody to do that. So patent trolls shouldn't be a problem if you've already done that um, um, research and there's no, that's what we, when we found out that our seizure pads were not patented already, we were blown away and we were able to move forward with the idea. Next question. It sounds like your workplace is amenable to you and your business partner's a great idea. How do you suggest growing one's idea in a not so supportive environment, especially when the invention is so specific to a type of nursing? Okay, um, it's unfortunate that um, some hospitals haven't realized that the potential of supporting your nurses for innovation actually benefits the hospital. It makes you look good from a marketing standpoint, and it makes you um, uh, it makes you look it makes your hospital more more fruitful. This is where you want to work. There's all these innovative nurses there. Um, and so if your hospital isn't providing that support, again, that's for you to find resources, to find like-minded nurses like yourself online or in person. You're not the only one. There's always, well, with Corona, everything's a little different. <laughs> but usually there are meetup groups for, uh, for people who are innovating and working on tech or working on other ideas to help you with that. So if your hospital isn't providing that, that's okay. Maybe there's a nurse in there that you can meet outside of work. Make sure you separate your idea from work. You don't want any confusion on whose idea it is because the hospital might try to take your intellectual property. But it's important to be able to separate those two and saying we're meeting outside of work, not at work, to talk about this idea. You can't be the only one in your whole hospital system who really wants to change that one problem that's specific to your type of nursing. All right, awesome. We have one from Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Um, you mentioned you work in both IT and the bedside for the same system. Are you hourly on both? Um, I currently am. My, um, my role has not been officially changed over. I'm kind of on loan to IT uh, some parts of the week, um, but I am technically hourly on that. And sometimes with my job, there, there's, you can have a dual role. I mean, with my hospital system, you can have a dual role. But uh, currently, I'm, I am hourly on both of them, but transitioning to when they make me a full position for allows me to be at the bedside and in IT, it might be salary, I'm not sure. 
We're working on the details. HR is not easy. Awesome. Fiki, as an African, do you think invention and innovation will be accepted in Africa's healthcare system? That is a that is a rough and uh, question that I think about all the time. Um, as as somebody who has family members who've been directly affected by the lack of healthcare um, and lack of innovative healthcare that we have, or even just basic healthcare in certain countries, like I said, I'm specifically from Nigeria. Um, it's it's I think it can be accepted, but there's a lot of roadblocks uh, because there's no infrastructure to to help an innovation go somewhere without having to deal with certain types of people. Um, it might depend on the country. I think some countries are doing really well. Um, um, some parts of South Africa are doing really well when it comes to their healthcare structure. Um, and in specifically Rwanda, their their healthcare system is very robust and actually very good. A friend of mine was there uh, for the last two years. Um, and so it depends on the country. It really depends on the country. Um, and I wish I can snap my fingers and I, I can take my idea, my own idea, back to where I grew up and back to help people that um, that uh, that I that I that I love and adore, but I understand because of the infrastructure in Nigeria, I cannot do that at this time. Hopefully, in the future. Okay, thank other you questions? for that. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Tafiki? If not, we had a few questions from earlier um, that I think that any of our hosts can actually answer. Um, so I can go ahead and put it out there because we have a few more minutes. Um, this is for any of you who are welcome to answer this, but how do you juggle all of your roles while equally caring for you? Um, I, I guess I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, I try to just section out my, like I try to have boundaries. We have to have steep boundaries. If I'm home um, and, I'm, and I'm with my wife and my child, I, that's what I'm doing. First thing I do when I get home, from work is I put my I put my phone on silent. I leave it downstairs. I'm upstairs with the baby. It is what it is. I'm not getting text messages about work. I'm not getting calls about work. And if I am, I can't I can't get them. You separate and you boundary. Um, when I'm doing, I'm also in a master's program. I have another eight to nine months to go. When I'm doing homework, I'm at home doing homework. Again, my phone is on silent. I'm in a locked off part of the house where I I have to set those physical boundaries. Uh, and so I think it's really important to to just be open with your uh, friend, family, significant other who might be that you have set these boundaries and this is what I need to do for this to get to, to be successful. Portia or Monica, do either of you have anything to add there? I'm just gonna piggyback off of what he said. I'm the same way. I have a 12 year old son who is like very active. He's a athlete and he's a musician and he's also on the robotics team. So he does everything. So I literally have to just set time aside and say, I have hours that I work. And after that, I don't answer emails. I don't answer text messages. When I'm with him, that's his time. And the same thing when I'm at home, when I'm writing, if I have a sign up that says I'm writing, do not disturb. He knows not to come and disturb me because he knows that I'm working. Yeah, I think it's all great advice. And I just piggyback and say that um, I kind of have to, Sorry, my husband. I have to, <laughs> point taken. Um, well, for one, my girls have an early bedtime. It was something that was really important to me um, when I found out about routines. When I got into this triplet moms group, all the triplet moms were like, the routine and the schedule is going to matter. Um, so we work on the early bedtime. So they go to bed at seven. And because they go to bed so early, I really take the time after they go down to work my businesses, to um, kind of catch up on emails and do anything that I need to do. Um, but during the day, especially with COVID and them being here and I'm doing telehealth some days, e-visits, I'm going into the hospital some days, it's really difficult to um, make it all mesh. So I just wanna echo Tafiki and Portia. You can kind of set aside some time and just for me, it's in the evenings. All right, and another question that we had, and um, well, actually we have a new one right here, let's see. Any advice or suggestions about steps to take if we were looking for a career side job beyond the bedside, but not sure what we want to do or still kind of searching for that passion? This is for any of you guys to answer. Um, I always say, uh, what are you good at? Like, uh, I have the nurses that I work with to write a goal setting sheet, and you need to write down everything that you're good at, 
And then you think about, could I do this for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? If you can't cross that out, because it's not something that you're going to love doing. Like for me, writing is something I've done since I was five years old. I can do it for the rest of my life and be content. Um, so just find out what it is that you're good at, what you like doing, and then figure out, if, is this something that, if I want to quit my nursing job today, is this something that I can do for, for the next 20 to 30 years? I agree. That little, Portia, that's literally perfect. Um, I was going to just add that. We're talking about nursing beyond the bedside, but I always, I always want to remind people, sorry, I always want to remind people that um, it, the bedside might actually be for you, and that's okay. You know, it's going to sound, you know, contrarian to what we're talking about, but if the bedside is still for you, if, if you're finding your joy at the bedside and you're not finding anything else that you want to do, that's okay. Continue um, improving patients' lives, and something might spark. You might say, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what I want to do. So keep searching. I think, I think the last thing I want to add for somebody who doesn't know, like I said in my, in my thing is that you want to make sure that you stay open to opportunities. You want to make sure you stay open to opportunities because somebody might say, hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? You might find out that you're really good at it. You might find out that you, but if you said, no, I'm busy and you might not be, but you might be fearful of doing the idea. <laughs> oh, look at, look at her. I think it's important to, uh, to, to just try it out. And you might not know what you'll land into and might end up enjoying. I want to add one more thing to that. A lot of times when you're working, you're doing things that are not technically your job, you know, not your title. If, you, if your job is like, for, me, for instance, every company that I've ever worked for has always asked me to help them to create programs, help them to create curriculum, help them to create, you know, things to boost morale. If your job is always asking you to do things that's not technically your job title, someone sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. You can take that and you can start a business with that if that's something that you enjoy doing. This is all such great advice. I'm absolutely loving this for myself. And as someone who left a bedside and who now manages social media, um, and helps host wonderful events for a great company. Like I have to say, like the biggest, the, I think going back to um, just opening yourself up to opportunity, that's kind of what I did and I didn't regret it at all. And it's been such a, so it's such a wonderful journey. So definitely kind of put yourself out there and try something new if that's something that you want to do. Um, and then I think our last question of the evening, um, I think someone asked it earlier, do any of you guys act as men mentors? Uh, I, I don't, um, but I think, I think there are many, I just don't know if I'm, it, my schedule's open enough to like, to give somebody the amount of advice that they might need. I don't want to, I don't want to fail somebody to be honest about it is that I currently, I'm not a mentor. Hopefully when I'm done with my master's and I'm a little more less busy, I can help other nurses who, who like myself. Um, um, there is a part of my business that we do consulting, but I mean, as a mentor, um, I think my, my plate is too full and that's my actually last is understanding that what's on your plate and accepting it and not adding more things so that's that's just me this is monica i, I do uh, mentor i do coaching calls i do group coaching um i actually have a, several different services that can be helpful for people looking for advice and help sorry um you can, you can connect with me at monica the np.com um and or on Instagram and give me Ramonica and we can kind of chat about it some more. Perfect. Um, I don't I don't mentor, but I do have um, I do have nurses that um, they come in. I kind of like coach them. I don't like to use the word coach, but I kind of help them to get started. And then I also started a membership where I just bring in different resources for nurses. Uh, like we have different speakers every month to help them with their freelance writing business. But I don't te technically consider myself a mentor. Wonderful. Well, we're at our time limit. Hopefully you all got as much out of this as I did and I am not a nurse. So take that for what it's worth. 
Um, we really appreciate you joining us. As I mentioned, we do have two other events this week in partnership with Shifting Forward. Please join us again. And one more reminder, you will get an email reminding um, you to please give us feedback. Your feedback will help us craft and shape all of our virtual events going forward when we have a lot coming. Um, so keep in touch with us, love us, find us on all of your favorite social media channels. And again, thank you to all of our speakers, um, Tofika, Tofiki, Monica, and Portia. Y'all are wonderful and extremely inspiring. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>